Um, so welcome, welcome. Um, I recognize a few of the names here, so welcome back to those who have been here before. For those who have not, um, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida. Um, we are still currently closed just because we are a small facility. It's hard to keep everything super safe for everyone, um, but we want to make sure we are still interacting with the community and providing some really cool resources for those of you who are also stuck indoors and staying safe. Um, so we started this webinar series. Uh, we are actually working on our August schedule. So everyone keep an eye on our social media um, and we will send out a email once it's finalized. Um, but we are really lucky to have a lot of really cool friends in the community that are willing to come out and give interesting presentations. Um, so today we are talking to George L. Heinrich. Um, he is a field biologist and environmental educator specializing in Florida reptiles. Um, he's originally from Connecticut and nurtured an interest in turtles from a very young age. Uh, his current work focuses on the conservation of the gopher tortoise, anthropogenic threats to diamondback terrapins, just like our very own Clem at the Marine Environmental Education Center, and the distribution of the Swanee Cooter. Um, today, we're going to be learning a lot about the big turtle year. So we are letting everyone in. We are going to keep everyone muted just so you can most clearly hear him. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat and he will go through them at the end and make sure we try to answer everyone's questions. If you have any issues, um, technical issues, feel free to write in the chat as well. Christina and I are both here to try and help virtually if there's any problem. Otherwise, whenever you are ready, George, please feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to be uh, having the opportunity to talk about a project of the Florida Turtle Conservation Trust, the Big Turtle mm -hmm. Year. This is the first time I've done a webinar, so bear with me. I've given this talk about 30, 35 times, but always with uh, real people in front of me. I guess you're real people, but it's pictures on my screen. So turtles, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background information before I just start talking about uh, the big turtle year, but they're very long-lived animals, some species only living 30, 40 years, but others well over 100 years, and they have quite high mortality while their eggs are juveniles, so they play a real important role in the, uh, in the food chain. And they have other ecological roles if you consider gopher tortoises, which dig these extensive burrow systems in the southeastern United States and provide homes for over 365 other species, protecting them from fire and, and predators. And a number of turtles around the world, more than half of them are quite uh, imperiled. They're one of the most endangered groups of turtles in the world. So when I talk to frog biologists or primatologists, they often make the same claim that they're right on up there and certainly isn't a competition that any of us want to uh, win. Fortunately, there's lots of conservation programs going on around the world for turtles. And I'm gonna talk about some of the ones that are occurring in the United States. So Florida, where I live, has 28 turtle species. Right now there are 62 species recognized in the United States. So 28 would be about 45% of all the diversity in the United States is found in Florida. And that's because of our significant habitat diversity we have coastal and marine systems, which provide homes for uh, five different species of, of marine turtles. And of course, our rivers and our freshwater ponds and lakes provide homes for a number of, of uh, freshwater turtle species. And we have diamondback terrapins uh, along our coastal areas and brackish waters. <clears throat> so as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm a wildlife biologist. I work on three different species of turtles. This is a diamondback terrapin up in the upper left corner, it's a coastal species. So it lives in brackish water. It's a molluscivore eating snails and clams and uh, suffering from uh, uh, loss of nesting habitat and also uh, mortality in crab pots. And my partners and I work on that particular project around the state. And the lower left is a swanee cooter, which is a riverine turtle. Uh, I have another uh, a group of partners that I work with on these. These live in, in rivers uh, along the Gulf Coast of, of Florida and the work that we're doing now is trying to determine what their true distribution is and how far south they actually uh, go. And we worked for a while on 
some anthropogenic, some human caused threats to this species like uh, illegal, illegal take for uh, food consumption. And then for a number of years, probably 30 years now, I've been working on gopher tortoise conservation issues. And that's a gopher tortoise on the, the lower right. I also do a lot of environmental education like we're doing here today, teach uh, five weeks of summer camps every summer and turtles and, and reptiles in general are a big part of, of those programs as well. This is my uh, partner, Tim Walsh. He's at the Bruce Museum and uh, up in Connecticut. And Tim and I had this idea of trying to see all of the turtles in Florida in a single year, that's 28 uh, species at present. But as we talked to colleagues and uh, uh, researchers around the United States, we started thinking maybe we ought to just go for the whole United States, see if we could see 62 species in a single year. That's the number now. When we did the big turtle year in 2017, there were only 59 species recognized. So on the left is Peter Pritchard. He's probably uh, uh, the most knowledgeable, was the most knowledgeable turtle biologist in the, in the world, certainly in the United States. Passed away this past uh, uh, February. And I talked to him about doing this project for a number of years and was also encouraged to go ahead and try to do the whole United States. Uh, the reasoning being it'd be easier to see all of the turtles in the United States in a single year than it would be to see all the turtles in Florida in a single year because a few of the Florida species would be extremely difficult uh, to find where those species have a bigger range outside of Florida. So we decided maybe we try to do the whole, the whole country. And then if you see the image on the right with Steve Martin from the, the movie The Big Year, so these guys were running around trying to see how many birds they could see in a a single year, a friend told me, watch this movie and see if that's what you want to do. So I did do that. And I, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to run around the United States and see a turtle and check it off and jump over somebody's fence and jump in a car and race off to see the next turtle. So that wasn't, wasn't our goal. We wanted to go ahead and learn as much as we could about uh, the natural history of turtles in the United States, their conservation status, and um, their general diversity. And the reason for focusing on the United States, it's the most turtle rich country in the world. 62 species of turtles. Mexico's uh, in second place, not very close at 49 species. So that's the number of species on the left. On the right is terminal taxa. So that would include subspecies of turtles. And you see we're still in the first uh, position there. So lots of turtles in the United States to see, 62 at present. Most people are aware of uh, the pressure on turtles for the pet trade or the food trade, uh, uh, particularly in, in Asia, where it's, it's very intense. But this is going on all over the world. There were something like 15,000 turtles recently caught in a poaching event in Mexico. And this occurs in the United States on a, on a regular uh, basis. So for the pet trade, for uh, medicinal purposes, and also for food, like you see these radiated tortoises on the lower right in Madagascar. So I realized I was not going to be able to go around the country by myself with a field guide and land in Nebraska at some airport, look in the field guide and say, I'm going to look for yellow mud turtles. And it says they live in prairies and then start driving around and trying to find a prairie. So we went ahead and put together a team of biologists and turtle conservationists and tried to get them on board to uh, meet up with us and, and lead us to where these turtles were. So we had quite a, an extensive team. Uh, I asked every one of them for quotes as to why they were interested in participating in this project. This is Dr. Uh, Grover Brown, who was saying that uh, he thought this project uh, would give U.S. turtle species uh, um, more awareness, and certainly that the United States could be argued to be the last stronghold for turtle diversity and abundance in the world. So a lot of our turtle populations are still in good shape, and we have a lot of habitat, but more than half of them are in need of some additional uh, conservation attention. So we needed to have a list to work from. And, uh, you know, if birders go out, they use a, a field guide. Uh, what we did was we used this Turtles of the World checklist put out by the Turtle Taxonomy Working Group. This was the eighth edition. It comes out every few years. Uh, we were using a 2014 edition for 2017. Halfway through our year, they came out with a new uh, edition, which I'll probably mention a little bit later. So this gave us 
uh, what species were out there. And we use that as our official checklist to work from. And we needed to have an educational component to this. We had donors providing funding for this project. And uh, we wanted to make sure that it was more than just me and uh, colleagues going around looking for turtles. We wanted to make sure that uh, we raised awareness about their natural history and diversity and conservation needs over the course of the year. So this is what I did for a year, almost uh, entirely. So our website for this particular project is still up. If you just Google the big turtle year, it's gonna take you right to it. And there's a, an extensive blog that you can see right here. And uh, every trip is outlined, including uh, species that we saw and habitats and uh, people along the way that were involved. And uh, sometimes great restaurants and cultural things that we participated in while we were we were there. There's also a species checklist and lists of uh, all the people that helped make this happen, both financially and logistically. So we had to set up some rules. Lots of people had ideas and suggestions how we had to do it. But uh, I decided that uh, all we needed to do was be able to see the turtle and have a second person confirm what we are seeing. I had people suggesting that we had to capture the turtles to photograph them. And of course, a lot of these animals are both state and federally listed. So we, we were not going to be uh, capturing those particular turtles. So this is a uh, Pearl River map turtle on the Bogota River in southern uh, Mississippi. We tried to photograph as many as we could. But there were some turtles like hawksbills when we were snorkeling in the Florida Keys. We just weren't getting photographs. And, um, but almost on every species, we had a second turtle biologist confirming what we were, we were looking at. So I wanted to start the year uh, in early January, January 1st at Boyd Hill Nature Preserve, which is one block from my home. I've been working on a gopher tortoise project there, studying tortoises and working on uh, habitat restoration and management projects for their benefit. And wanted to start there on January 1st, go out look for gopher tortoises. And, you know, it's January 1st, so it's kind of cold. But by that afternoon, it warmed up enough that we were able to go over there and see several gopher tortoises walking, uh, walking around, including a little hatchling tortoise that we've been monitoring for a couple of weeks. And uh, we were hoping would still be visible on January the, uh, the 1st. So this is the only tortoise in the United States east of the Mississippi River. There's uh, four tortoise species that I'll talk about during the course of the presentation. So this is kind of like a, a natural history talk and travel log blending together. And I'm going to have to move at a pretty good pace because I can talk about these for eight hours. And I don't think we have that much uh, time allotted. So this is up in northern Florida. This is a college student who's been working with me since he was nine years old, who's really into uh, uh, turtles. Uh, we joined some researchers up at Itchituckin Springs State Park and picked up uh, uh, on the left the Florida red-bellied cooter and on the right the Swanee cooter. There's seven species of cooters in the uh, United States and I got to see all of those and I'll, I'll show you some photos as we go along the way. Since I work on Swanee cooters here in the Tampa Bay region, I'm, I was particularly interested in seeing uh, all of the other species as well. So we were able to join researchers, find out what their, their goals were for their projects. So here you can see a team of biologists working on uh, Swanee Cooters, at least in the middle and on the right. Can't tell what the person on the left is working on there. Uh, flew up to Connecticut. So during the course of this, this project, I took 25 flights and I was gone 100 nights. So it was a, a busy year looking for uh, turtles. There were times where I landed at the Tampa airport on Tuesday night, Thursday morning, I was flying back out again. So I'd only be home for, for one day. So this is up in the uh, uh, central Connecticut Valley where I grew up. I grew up in Southwestern Connecticut. So this was just a little bit, a uh, little bit east of there, uh, spotted turtle in uh, a very rural uh, area. It was, it was really nice being able to see a spotted turtle there for the big turtle year since I used to see these as a kid uh, in the seventies in uh, Connecticut. Highly sought in the pet trade, often uh, victims in poaching events, which is quite unfortunate. I'm aware of one particular poaching event with a couple hundred spotted turtles in uh, recent years uh, in New York State. I flew out to Texas. That was going to be a big trip. We had about 10 days allotted for it and uh, 
there uh, were 12 species that we were going after. We found every one of them because of this gentleman, uh, Carl Franklin, who's with uh, Texas Turtles. It's a really good group that focuses on Texas turtle conservation and biology. You can, you can Google them if you want to know more about it. Uh, this guy knew where everything was. Uh, so we, uh, we got 12 species, I think, in eight days. We finished up a couple of days early. And there were some really great uh, turtles along the way, but there were some common turtles as well, like this red-eared slider. So I spent some time photographing it. It was nice seeing red-eared sliders where they actually are supposed to be instead of all over Florida where they don't belong, uh, courtesy of the, the pet trade. This is at a, a, a site in Austin, uh, Texas. And this is a Texas cooter on the right here. So this slide illustrates how much people like turtles. There were dozens of people out watching these turtles. There were a number of species there. I think we got three of them for the big turtle year there, including two endemics. Endemics are turtle species or any uh, plant or animal that are only found in that particular state or uh, country. And so we picked up both the Texas cooter and the Texas map turtle there. So there's 14 species of map turtles in the United States. We found all 14 of them with uh, quite a bit of work. Here's an alligator snapping turtle. At the time that we were doing the project, there were three species of alligator snapping turtles recognized. Uh, now there are only two species. Scientists are always adding and dropping things uh, with whatever argument, uh, both with morphological evidence or genetic evidence as to whether things are, are valid. And this is the uh, alligator snapping turtle. We caught two of them. We put out these big hoop net traps and baited them right near Houston, Texas. So this is right on the edge of the city of Houston. and. Uh, we baited these things, and I think the largest one that we captured was uh, something like 88.4 pounds. So this, these turtles uh, exhibit great sexual dimorphism. Males can push 250 pounds, and females are much, much uh, smaller. So depending upon what species of turtles, sometimes the females are larger, sometimes the males are much larger. But these are turtles that live in river systems and uh, need to have uh, healthy habitats with diverse food available and often suffer from uh, uh, take by humans for, for consumption, either on bush hooks or trapping them, uh, often illegally. This is the National Butterfly Center in the lower Rio Grande Valley uh, up against the Rio Grande River. So this property borders the river and then Mexico on the other side. You might be uh, recognizing the name of the National Butterfly Center because this is uh, a place where they're building a wall between the river and the, uh, the center through right through private property. So reducing their accessibility to their own uh, property, unfortunately. And this was a site where I was told that we'd be able to find Texas tortoises, a very small range in Southern Texas. And then they go in, down into uh, Mexico. Only found one, it was this little juvenile, but that's all it took to give us a check mark on our, on our list. We, uh, Carl and I were able to join a herpetologist there named uh, Myra Oyervides, and she uh, took us out to uh, several sites along the Rio Grande Valley to look for wildlife. Really hot there. Uh, I was really excited to go look for this, this uh, species of, of turtle. This is a habitat for the the Big Bend mud turtle, or what's called the Mexican Plateau mud turtle. And it only lives in the Big Bend region of Texas, right on the border. And um, most of its range, almost all of its range is in Mexico, except for a few small ponds in southern Texas. So it's clearly one of the rarest turtle species in the United States. So we trapped here uh, under permits. And this is uh, owned by the Department of Transportation in Texas. So we had a drive about 100 plus miles out of the way to get a key and then the next day drive 100 miles back to return the key. But we put little traps out and baited them and got a hold of uh, some of these little big men mud turtles. So this is a species like uh, uh, a lot of uh, little mud turtles that are suffering from uh, uh, big drops in, in water levels and very small uh, ranges within the United States and uh, needs to have cooperation between two countries in order to uh, continue to protect the, uh, 
the species. So I thought I was going from Texas to California, but found out I had to fly back to Florida, teach one class, and then fly back out to California the following day. So that was kind of a lot more traveling than I intended for that leg. But I flew into Los Angeles and joined some friends uh, there and started traveling to some sites in California to look for turtles. They don't have a lot of turtles in California. Most of the turtle diversity is in the uh, eastern, particularly southeastern United States. But we wanted to go look for the desert tortoise, uh, the Mojave desert tortoise. And it was exciting when we started putting this project together and realized the funding was coming in, the commitment was there, biologists were stepping forward and saying, I'll meet you at the airport, I'll pick you up, I'll show for you around, don't worry about anything. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to be my opportunity to go to places that I've read about that I never went to. And I, I was really careful about picking spots so that I wasn't only just getting the desert tortoise, I was getting to visit a natural area that I dreamed about for, for years. So this is uh, east of, of Los Angeles, beautiful uh, desert preserve. And it looks nice where it's protected, but once you cross out of the fence, or if you turn due left, and look off to the left, once you cross that fence, it's totally denuded from these off-road vehicles just destroying uh, all of the uh, available habitat. So the desert tortoise has had some nice stuff inside the fence, but not so nice once you started getting outside of protected uh, areas. So this is a species that has suffered because of uh, Bureau of Land Management Practices, cattle uh, wandering around on federal property and uh, destroying the, uh, the vegetation where they eat and also problems with ravens eating uh, a lot of the, uh, the young tortoises. Anywhere you have people around, you get large populations of ravens, and they're just picking off the small turtles. So lots of biologists, lots of federal funding trying to save the uh, Mojave Desert tortoise. So it was that morning we were in a hotel. Sometimes we camp, sometimes we were in hotels. Uh, and that morning I got up and it was like something like 47 degrees. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to see any turtles at 47 degrees, so probably should going to have to wait until it warms up. But in the desert, when it's cold at night and early morning, but it gets pretty hot quick. And by 11 o'clock, I started spotting some tortoises just kind of laying there and trying to stretch. You know, these are solar-powered uh, animals. So from there, we, we drove to the west coast near Los Angeles. Uh, this is in the Santa Monica Mountains. And we were looking to see uh, western pond turtles. It's, uh, a, it was, at the time, a single species of turtle. Uh, since then, it's been split into two species of turtles, which means I have to go back to see the other one, which uh, they, look, they look alike. They're just genetically different. And one of them's further north along the Pacific range, and the other one's further south. So we were in the southern part of uh, their range. You have to take my word assuming you can see my cursor, there were pond turtles out here on these logs that we were able to see with, uh, with spotting uh, scopes. So beautiful little turtle. This one here was missing a leg, was at a rehabilitation facility. Raccoons had uh, chewed its leg off. So lots of predation uh, happens to these uh, wild animals. From California, I went uh, up to uh, the Northeast. I was doing a two week trip between the Northeast and Midwest, and hoping to pick up about a dozen turtle species. And I met up with my friend, Jim Angley, who at the time was a postman for the US Postal Service and also volunteered with New Jersey Wildlife. He's since retired from the post office and now works for uh, New Jersey Wildlife doing turtle surveys and looking for old, uh, uh, visiting old sites where there were historic records of salamanders and so on. So here he's holding an eastern box turtle, and Tim is collecting some uh, morphometric data off of that box turtle. You know, people think of New Jersey, and they picture the industrial areas and so on, but New Jersey's a beautiful state. There's lots of gorgeous habitat in the Pine Barrens and coastal areas and mountainous northwest and, and uh, habitat with bog turtles and diamondback terrapins and, and so on. And Jim made sure that we saw quite a, quite a few uh, turtle species while we were, we were there. Here's a little hatchling diamondback terrapin along the coast. And it's uh, uh, right next to a, a road that goes out to the, the beaches. And you can see that it's, it can't get to the marshy habitat. So this one was either going to dry up in the intense heat along that road, or it was gonna get picked off by, uh, 
by predators, we went ahead and relocated them over this barrier so they had a chance. So I was kind of disappointed to actually find diamondback terrapins there because uh, one of my partners and I have studied diamondback terrapins for years in northeastern Florida, and I really wanted to get diamondback terrapins at our study site. But uh, we came across these first, so our records were in New Jersey. While we were there, we joined up with some biologists from uh, the uh, New Jersey Wildlife. Uh, Brian here is the state herpetologist and took us out to see bog turtles, a species that I've tried to see before, very rare, uh, often uh, in the pet trade, smuggled and stolen out of the wild and smuggled and can go for thousands of dollars depending upon where you're uh, selling it. And I think we found about eight that morning walking around in this uh, bog habitat. Just beautiful little animals. They used to call them uh, Muhlenberg. So this is an adult in a person's hand, quite, quite large. So you could see how easily you could go out and get a dozen or so of these and smuggle them uh, out of the country. So while I was there, a couple of the biologists asked me, do you know what lives in this habitat? And I turned around and looked at it and said, yeah, that's where we're going to find wood turtles. Because I grew up in Connecticut and we had wood turtles. So I knew what wood turtle habitat looked for. And that's what we started finding. So we got some nice uh, adult turtles there, measured them. It was covered with ticks everywhere I went in northern New Jersey. I had hundreds of ticks on me for days. And then we figured, let's go to Central Park in New York City and see what kind of turtles. So we climbed to the top of uh, Belvedere Castle and set up a spotting scope with a long scope and aimed it down towards uh, the shoreline and uh, started seeing red-eared sliders and various pet store turtles all through these ponds where people have these pet turtles and eventually just release these animals. Uh, we didn't pick up anything that we needed and they weren't natural populations, but since we could do it, we went ahead and visited the site. And then headed to, to Coastal, Massachusetts and visited a state forest there where the northern red-bellied cooter lives. So red-bellied cooters are in the northeastern United States, but this population is disjunct. It's off by itself. It's 200 miles from the next nearest population in uh, New Jersey. And this was a, a cool place to visit. Theodore Roosevelt and his colleagues used to, to camp here and fish here, and I'm sure they swam in this pond like we did. Hopefully it wasn't as cold for them as it was when we were in there. But we were able to catch a number of, uh, of these big, beautiful red-bellied uh, cooters. So they're common in other places, but this is a disjunct, a separated, you know, fragmented population that's protected uh, by the federal government and federal funding goes into trying to uh, save this uh, turtle and build this population up. So there's Head Start programs and other efforts uh, to try to get a healthier population. So this is a little different from the populations that are 200 miles away. When these migrate, they go across land whereas the northern red-bellied cooters and the rest of the range, when they migrate, they use uh, canal systems. So there's some different behaviors going on there as well. So that's probably one of the uh, least studied turtles in the uh, northeastern United States. So we were trying to get a bigger bang for our buck, so we, we flew uh, to Chicago instead of coming back down to Florida and joined some turtle people and went up to an undisclosed location in Mississippi. I say undisclosed because people would ask us where exactly. I'd have people ask me the name of the town or the forest I was in, or one person even asking me if I would mind sharing GPS coordinates with them. And uh, somebody that I didn't even know called me and asked me if I could give them coordinates so they could visit it. Well, that's, that's a good sign that that person's a, a poacher of some, some level. Either they wanted a couple of turtles for themselves or wanted to uh, make some money. Of course, we didn't give any information out. So if you go to the Big Turtle Year site, every time, every place we went, we listed exactly where we got things if it was a, a, a protected area, if it was a, a, a national forest or something where you didn't have to worry about pr um, protection or the information was already out there on the internet that the turtles live there. But in some places, like this spot here, all it said was southwestern Michigan. And that's as much information as we were willing to uh, share. We always asked the researchers we were visiting, how, how detailed can we be? And 
And some of them just wanted us to say Central New Jersey. Other ones had no problem with us naming the site because their websites already talked about the species occurring in their particular uh, uh, public property. So we were out here looking for spotted turtles uh, at this time, painted turtles and uh, blandings turtles. This is a blandings turtle. You know, these are really cool turtles. They live a long time and uh, little dots all over the shell. They're about the size of a helmet. And uh, there's, there's specimens where they've documented females with eggs at 88 years of age. So turtles can keep reproducing even to the point when they're uh, quite, quite old. So these are grabbed for the pet trade and uh, can suffer from uh, habitat loss and uh, water levels changing, getting hit by cars and so on, like a lot of species. Beautiful turtles and yellow chin, hard to mistake for anything else. And wood turtles, one of my favorite ones. This is why I'm always covered with ticks. So this is a big, beautiful uh, adult wood turtle. And these, again, are same things, highly sought after for the pet trade, uh, habitat loss, getting hit by, by cars as well. And they can also suffer from recreational collecting. So some people are out camping, they're taking a hike, they see a little wood turtle, they pick it up to take it home. And this is one of those species where it only takes removal of a few species to begin to cause a downward decline for the population size of a given uh, location. Wood turtles, because they look like sculptured uh, wood, one of my favorite species. So there are uh, two species or more, depending who you talk to, of box turtles in the United States. There's an eastern group of box turtles, which some people uh, recognize as more than one species. And then there's an ornate box turtle. Uh, this is the ornate, and it was in western Illinois, a very small preserve with the population of these turtles. Uh, it was already on the state's website, talking all about the presence of these turtles there, so we weren't spilling the beans, uh, per se. And some of the folks from the Chicago Herpetological Society were kind enough to organize a trip out there. Some of the members on the bottom right. So, you know, I like turtles like this that are all banged up and scarred and look like they've been in fire and they're missing a leg because it shows what survivors of turtles are. They don't all look perfectly nice like you see in magazine photos. Uh, a lot of them are, are missing limbs and eyes and shells have major cracks from getting hit by a car or farm machinery or boats or so on. So we flew back to Florida and decided it was time to start looking for some marine uh, species. There were five that we needed to find and spent some time in the Keys and had no luck. So I was a little discouraged there, but uh, Charlie Miller, another person who used to be a student, nine years old, I met him. He's now a biology teacher in New Jersey, has his own mark recapture project with box turtles with his high school students on some public property next to the school. He organized our uh, trips for looking for sea turtles in Florida. And we connected with Florida Leatherbacks Inc., which is down in your area in southeastern Florida at their study site where they do some tremendous work with uh, leatherbacks, the largest of the living uh, turtles. So when Chris Johnson said to hold still, Charlie and I held still, but the turtle didn't hear it. You can see it moved its head, see it moved its head a little bit. But these are are quite large turtles, seven, eight hundred pounds. So that that day that we were there on a single night, we got nine loggerhead sea turtles, four green sea turtles, and two leatherbacks. We saw all three species in like one hour. So I went from discouraged after three days of not finding anything to elated with three new species in an hours uh, hours time. So I can't say enough about Florida Leatherbacks Inc. It's a, a great project and they're doing some tremendous satellite work and visit them on uh, Facebook. So Tim came down. I was the only one that went on every trip. Tim came as many as he could. He has a regular job. He's not as fortunate as me to be self-employed and able to set his own schedule. But we went to Alabama to look for this particular turtle called the flattened musk turtle. It's an endemic to Alabama. In fact, it only lives in the Black Warrior River system in um, uh, the northern central part of the, of the state in this uh, rocky habitat. So very, very difficult to, uh, 
to find really a little small flat turtle, federally listed species, adapted to probably get between rocks and stuff during flooding events. These are highly sought after for the, the pet trade. The gentleman that was working on them here, Joe Jenkins, was a master's student at uh, Auburn University, and we caught two. Tim caught one, I caught one, we were holding them up, and I said, hey, what could, what could we get for these on the pet trade? It's, of course, it's illegal. I wanted to know what kind, of, what kind of incentive is there for people to take these animals from the wild? I had two in my hand, and he said, you know, if it was Saturday morning. He said, if you're patient and you wait to the end of the weekend, we can get $7,000 out of Japan or Germany. So when you have that kind of money available for animals, people are going to poach a speech, species, unfortunately. Beautiful little turtles. Again, endemic. We only found them at one little area, the Black Warrior River system in Alabama. This is another cooter. I mentioned I study Swanee cooters in Florida, so I was really excited to try to get all seven of the, the cooter species. This is called the Alabama uh, uh, cooter. It only lives in Mobile Bay in southern uh, uh, Alabama and across the Mississippi state line, Gauthier, uh, I think it's pronounced Gauthier, Mississippi, just one little area. So very small range, uh, has a major interstate going through it. So a number of turtles get hit by cars, particularly uh, females when they're off the nest, or males perhaps moving between bodies of water um, and uh, water quality issues. So Mobile Bay has lots of industrial uses and the species uh, is at risk because of some of the water quality issues. Alabama uh, uh, cooter. So I mentioned earlier that there are 14 species of map turtles. Again, these guys are, are sought in the pet trade, so they're poached heavily. Uh, some of the map turtles we picked up by uh, snorkeling in clear rivers, uh, and sometimes by canoeing. Uh, sometimes we were able to connect with biologists studying these turtles, and we were able to um, trap the turtles legally and get some photographs. Here we're watching from bridges, so you can see Tim is looking at, I believe that's a, a yellow belly, federally listed yellow belly um, map turtle. It's hard to tell from that photo being so small, but that was from spotting scopes from a number of bridges. So now it's summer and I had to stop chasing turtles around the country and do five weeks of camps. I make a significant part of my income doing a summer camp season. So I stopped and I thought, you know, well, there's some turtles maybe I can get where my campsites are at that I'm missing. So, you know, I told the kids, whoever can find the striped mud turtle gets $5. So I have a lot of people now participating in the big turtle year. And here's Chloe picked up number 43, our little striped mud turtle. So it was, it was already mid-summer and we were at 43 species so we thought we had a pretty good chance at 59. Beautiful. You know mud turtles and, and uh, musk turtles I think are underrated and underappreciated. Very cool little turtles that are uh, some of them having very small ranges like the Big Ben mud turtle that I talked about in Texas earlier. Some of them quite extensive ranges. I was in southern Georgia looking for chicken turtles. I was always looking for chicken turtles. They're winter nesters. So here it was now already October. I was with a friend of mine, Dirk Stevenson, and some other biologists looking for chicken turtles and just never found them everywhere we went. But on one of the days while we were there, we were trying to trap swanee alligator snapping turtles. It's a different species of turtle. This is in a, a state wildlife refuge that I'll leave unnamed. But all of this happened in one morning. We were driving out to check our traps, and Dirk and I spotted a seven foot three inch eastern indigo snake, a federally threatened species crawling. He's permitted to, to work on those, so we were able to catch it and work it up. I pulled a trap out of the water with this beautiful alligator, Swanee alligator snapping turtle, which are only found in the Swanee River system. I went back to my truck and was cleaning up, checking messages, and my son said, You need to come back to Florida. You just am a great grandfather. So all of this happened in like, I think it was like four hours time. So it was a pretty good, pretty good day. I went out to Arizona uh, in the fall and met up with Christina Jones, a friend of mine, and a turtle biologist out there. She was going to be doing some survey work and took me around the state to see 
some pretty rare species. So we were looking for Arizona, uh, Arizona mud turtles, a large mud turtle, as you can see in my hands here, living right on the border at a national wildlife refuge. I won't mention uh, which one, but I've seen pictures of this part of the year where this pond is completely dry. So here you can see some turtles are in this uh, collapsible trap. So this is a project of the American Turtle Observatory where they're, they were doing some pilot studies and now they're, they're extending, expanding that particular project. Here we're working them up, quite large mud turtle. Right on the border, you can see the, the wall as we were working. We radio tracked some of them and some of them actually went down into kangaroo rat holes and would spend the winter down there. And then drove to organ pipe. So this is, uh, if you're following the news about the wall that's going in, this is an area that has a, a, a federally endangered species of turtle that only lives in a half an acre pond. This is it, this is their whole range, two springs feed this half acre pond and then that drains across the border into Mexico. You can hit a golf ball uh, across the fence into the next country from here. So we were at Quito Baquito uh, Springs looking for the Sinoida mud turtle, which is a subspecies of Sonoran mud turtle. And the population estimate that year from their sampling was only 182 turtles living in the United States. 182 of the species. We caught 46 of them during that trapping event and, and uh, marked them and so on. So here you can see a series of traps that are out there trying to, to catch them. They're not very big. So this is a federal wildlife biologist marking turtles. I think I was probably the most excited about seeing that one. The first one I had seen was several years before at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And uh, I was really wanting to see one of these in the wild. So I think the picture of my expression tells you how excited I was. But this species is really suffering from uh, uh, problems with the habitat. So this little, these little spring runs uh, fill in and they've had to use concrete to reinforce them to keep the water moving. So here they're photographing, somebody's photographing one that's probably maybe four or five weeks old, really small little uh, Sonoida mud turtle. And the biggest threat right now is this. And as they're drilling and putting these pipes in and stuff, it's lowering the water level in these ponds. But on this side of the fence here facing us is, is the pond. And there you can see a highway going right across on the Mexican side of the, uh, the uh, border. So we needed to see the Sonoran desert tortoise and uh, went up, it was already getting late in the year. And the only chance we had of doing that was by radio tracking. So here you can see one with a transmitter on its back. I was trying to reach into the burrow to see if I could get a better picture of it. I forgot about the rattlesnakes, which we saw a number of, but none in that particular hole. Probably what was even more exciting than radio tracking this desert tortoise was radio tracking horned lizards. They had little transmitters attached to them. And we went from here and uh, went out and radio tracked these tiny little horned lizards that eat harvester ants. That was, that was pretty exciting. One more trip back to the Gulf Coast to try to pick up some missed species. This is the razorback musk turtle. They, they exude this uh, s smelly musk. So you can see Dirk here sniffing it. I tried to get him to lick it because it has this weird uh, acrid sensation on your tongue, but I couldn't convince him to, to do that. Another map turtle we picked up, pearl. Pearl River map turtle. This was in the Bogota in southern Mississippi. Another protected species. So we were only able to capture this in photograph because we were working with the gentleman with permits. So 14 species of map turtles. This is a federally listed ringed map turtle. So you can see why they'd be exploited for the pet trade. So these live in specific river systems. So it's not like you can just go to any river along the Gulf Coast and find it. You have to go to certain river systems. So if you're in the Pascagoula River system, you're going to be looking for, for uh, uh, Pascagoula map turtles and uh, uh, another species of map turtle. And in this particular river, you're looking for ring map turtles and Pearl River map turtles. And if you're in the Apalachicola River system in the Florida Panhandle, you're looking at 
uh, Apalachicola map turtles. So they're in specific river systems from Florida to Texas, 14 species. We went to the Jones Ecological Research Center in Georgia to try to get the, another alligator snapping turtle, the uh, Apalachicola alligator snapping turtle, which has since been sunk. And we did not catch that. We did see Barber's map turtles. This one was not photographed there. This was in the Florida panhandle. Beautiful uh, uh, male map turtle. So we were down to just missing a few species. I needed to get out and look for the uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. Colleagues were telling me that good luck. That's going to be a tough one. But I, I remembered seeing these when I was studying Diamondback Terrapins many years ago. So I contacted a colleague that I worked on that project and said, any chance that we recorded GPS coordinates when we saw Kemp's Ridley's along the coast of Florida up near Steenhatchee? And sure enough, we did. So I posted on Facebook, I need somebody with a boat uh, to go look for Kemp's Ridley's. And this couple, some friends of mine, Lynn and Nancy, contacted me and said, when are we leaving? And we went up there and uh, rode around and, and spotted, uh, I spotted two, Lynn saw three. Uh, sub-adults. They live in the Steenhatchee area along the Big Bend shallow waters uh, as uh, small turtles. So we were quite lucky to get that one. And then we needed one more. I was missing a Hawksbill sea turtle. Larry uh, Woods, who spoke as part of your webinar series earlier, uh, was kind enough to uh, tell me about different spots. He contacted me right before Christmas and said, hey, if you can get down to uh, Isla Mirada right now, there's a hawksbill sea turtle. So I contacted a friend in Chicago a day or two before Christmas and said, you need to get on a plane and get down here right now. And uh, he, he uh, told me, you know, it's Christmas and I can't really leave, but I could hear his wife in the background saying, just go. So we met up and we drove down to the Keys and I spent a few hours snorkeling and saw that, that one hawksbill. I'm sure it was the one that he, uh, he referred to. So we were at 56 species. We were missing three. It was just after Christmas, and I was still missing a chicken turtle. And we were driving around looking everywhere. I'd been looking for it for months in several states. And we were at Fakahatch and Strand State Preserve. This is a species that lives in ephemeral waters. Um, it's not something you can just go out and say, let's go get one today. I looked for months and uh, spotted this one at Fakahatchee on about, I think it was around December 27th or 28th. So long necks. Uh, you can see it has a reticulated pattern, striped hind pants, only these and sliders have these in Florida. This one's a male, a large tail. So we picked up number 57 and had two to go. One of them we needed to go to Texas, but it was already too cold. And I realized at that point that we were going to end the year at 57 uh, species of turtles. So we missed two, the Apalachicola alligator snapping turtle and the yellow mud turtle. The alligator, the Apalachicola alligator snapping turtle is no longer recognized as a valid species, uh, but it was at that time. And the yellow mud turtle we should have found, but we had uh, no luck locating those in Texas or anywhere else that we were looking at in Oklahoma out west. So there's still a couple species that I need, would like to be able to find someday. They split the pond turtles in California up into two. So I've been trying for the last two springs early summers to get up to Northern California. Hello. <laughs> I see some friends waving their hands that live in Northern California. And uh, uh, we ended up having to cancel because of the current uh, pandemic. So maybe next year I'll be able to get out there and look for this particular Northern uh, pond turtle. It's called the Northern Western uh, pond turtle. I'm also missing the yellow mud turtle. And now they've described a new species of mud turtle in the western panhandle of Florida called the intermediate uh, musk turtle, actually. So there's three species that I hope to be able to find uh, down the road so that I've seen all the ones in the U.S. So we've been doing lots of educational programs. The one that I'm doing today is the 32nd one and on this project in eight states. And the first one that's been done uh, as a webinar Lots of project partners. We would not have been able to find this many species of turtles without all these biologists and conservationists that participated along the way and the dozens of people that uh, contributed financially to making this, uh, this initiative possible. 
So I encourage you to go on to the Florida Turtle Conservation Trust uh, uh, website. It's ftct.org. That could lead you to the Big Turtle Year or Google the Big Turtle Year. So if you want more details than I could share in 45 minutes, there's a nice blog on the Big Turtle Year site. Lots of great photos, I think, and uh, lots more detail about uh, the natural history and conservation needs of, of turtles in the, uh, the United States. So thank you very much for your attention. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we do have a few questions in that group chat. If you want to uh, stop sharing screen, it should be at the top of your screen. Um, and you'll be able to start checking out that chat once you click the chat button at the bottom. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to read them off to you if you can't see it. Um, I'll let you read them off. Perfect. Let me see. Thanks. We had someone ask, how many turtles are there in Canada? In Canada, there are eight species of turtles, if you don't count marine species. So I don't count them because they don't come out of the water and go on to land. Uh, I'd like to go up there and do all eight Canadian turtle species. Uh, my partner that I did the U.S. project with said, but you've already seen all eight of those species. But my answer was, yeah, but not in Canada. So we're hoping to be able to go up there at some point and look for them. They're all in pretty small area. You can't find turtles too far north in Canada. Probably be a little faster of a year with just the eight. <laughs> Might be able to do it in a, uh, you know, a long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone asked, are you currently accepting volunteers for the big turtle year? Well, the big turtle year field stuff is over. At this point, we're, uh, we're just trying to uh, uh, give talks and write articles. There's a couple magazine articles. If you go to the, uh, the big turtle year website and get into the blog, there's links that go into a couple magazine articles that we did uh, that summarize the, uh, the project. But we do use volunteers for our field research projects, but that's mostly, mostly college students from uh, the Tampa Bay region. Very nice. We have a, a long one. In addition to the two species that you didn't get and the new species that have been defined since you did the big turtle year, is there a species outside of the U.S. you haven't seen and is on your bucket list? Outside of the U.S.? I'm interested in seeing some of the Mexican species of turtles. I've been down there looking for uh, what people call the holy grail of turtles, the spotted box turtle with a uh, Robert Villa, a friend of mine, and, and uh, we were down there for five days and found one. And uh, fortunately, we got that, that one because it was a lot of work trying to, to find them. But I'm interested in looking at some of the turtles that live on the other side of the border that I've seen in the United States. And down there, they have a, a more extensive range, but not one in particular that I could pick out. Very cool. Um... Do you have suggestions for how to control the problem of turtles being released that were originally purchased or obtained as pets? Well, in Florida, I think the program that the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has developed uh, called, it's an amnesty day, I believe they call it. So you can turn in turtles or parrots or anything you have that you shouldn't release. Um, no questions asked. So if you have stuff you shouldn't have, my understanding is you're not going to have too many problems. They'll accept the animal, but the problem is they only have one or two of those a year. So it's not, you know, you have to kind of wait. And I get a number of phone calls. Every week I get phone calls with people with turtles that they no longer want. People buy these things like they do with dogs and other things. And after a while, they don't want them any, anymore. So it's very difficult to, uh, to place these. There are a number of herpetological societies or turtle organizations here in Tampa Bay. We've got the Tampa Bay Turtle and Tortoise Society, and they have members who will often take these animals in and give them, give them uh, good care. Very good to know. Um, I had a question. Did you have a background in photography before you started this venture? Because those photos were amazing. And as someone who tries to photograph the turtles at the center, it's not easy to get a turtle to stop and pose. <laughs> no, it's hard, hard to photograph <laughs> turtles. Um, I've been interested in photography since I was uh, a young adult. My father did a lot of photography and taught me some. And, and uh, you know, when you get one good picture like that, there's like 99 more that are no good. So the trick I always find is just, just shoot dozens or hundreds of photos if you really want a good picture of a, of a turtle. They, they don't hold still. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we use a very similar method with the few turtles we have at the Meek. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions. A couple people said, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the session, very informative. Um, thank you, thank you. If you have any questions, throw them in. We'll hang out for a few more minutes. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for coming today, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about turtles. <laughs> I, I see some friends. Kevin, thanks for checking in, and Mary Ann and family. Uh, how you doing? That's, they're from the other side of the big pond. Oh, wow. Very cool. Thank you for coming today. Um, we do have uh, this recorded, so if you missed the beginning, we will be posting it to our YouTube page. Um, if you think of any questions that you can't think of right now, feel free to email us at meek at nova.edu. And if we can't answer them, we will send them right along to George because he knows all of the turtley things. Um, and on Thursday at 1 p.m., if you are free, we are holding another webinar. Um, we are going to actually be doing our marine turtles. We are meeting with the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program to discuss how the sea turtle nesting season has been going so far. It is starting to wrap up a little bit, um, so we're going to get some of those numbers and talk a little bit about how they are doing. Um, but otherwise, I don't see any questions. Lots of thank yous. Thank you again so much for coming in. This was very interesting. Um, otherwise, everyone have a great day. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye.